one, one of the challenges that I faced very, very early in my career, especially in Parliament, was the fact that women were not visible. And I remember holding a conference in 1984 and we came up with a big heading that said women demand 50% of places in, the, in, in, in Parliament. We are not pleading to be given handouts. We are actually demanding. It drew a lot of anger in government. The women did not relent. They felt that they had to get women into parliament, into local authorities, so that they are where decisions are made. We were also training government officers so that they too would learn to analyze government policies in order to establish to what extent even the national budget will benefit women and women's development programs. The women's movement took the trouble to engender them to make sure that they are better representatives of women than any of the men in parliament could be. Of course, the culture worked against us. The culture would not recognize women political leaders. That, even today, is a major handicap for female candidates vying for political office. If truly we were more than 50% of the population, then we had, we had that responsibility of making sure that we not only popularize female candidates, but that we also vote for them. There was also a lot of effort at that time to divide women into the elite and the grassroots. I remember that presented a real handicap to our agenda. That is because any woman seen to have education was labeled as an elite. Your education is supposed to have alienated you. If we allowed ourselves to get preoccupied with that, then we lost a lot of ground, we lost a lot of time. Because when we went to the rural areas and asked women, what would you like the government to do for you? They would say, what do you think we educated you for? In Kenya, and we realized in the, in the various African countries, we realized that actually, the problems, many problems that affect women in their adulthood, you know, started when they were children. And we felt that if you could support the girl child, her health, her nutrition, and ensured that girl children are not married too early, you would be contributing to their safe motherhood and to their enjoyment of life as human beings. So the agenda of women's education as a prerequisite for development was a very good tool for us from 1985 onwards. And I think that's when I started talking very forcefully about girls' education. I imagined myself a minister of education. What would I do for the girl child? And that's what I put down for them. They liked it, they asked me to create the organization. So in 1993, FAWE was registered as an NGO, although the membership was drawn from members who are government uh, ministers, assistant ministers, and vice chancellors of universities. They had decided, with our support, to use the government machinery, to use their clout in government and in parliament to promote girls' education.
I think the most important out outcome of Huawei were policy changes. Policy changes in favor of girls' education in our various African countries. Today, I look back, I believe a lot of the success we achieved was because of our united action, where we lost, and in many instances, we were losers. It is because of divisions within the women's movement. If we were talking one language, people would listen to us. The, the best thing about living long enough to go through all these phases is to see the change that has occurred from 1985 to today, when we kind of told women unapologetically, you are good leaders, get on with it.